our webinar today titled, What is Fraud Costing You? I'll give you a little bit of a background of, on myself. <clears throat> I am a principal here at Maynard Custerison in the Business Accounting Services Department. Um, my background, or I, I started my career, kind of grew up in the audit department, so I've always had that kind of in the back of my head, and I've transitioned in the last you know, five or so years to do more management advisory services, which is very ambiguous, I know, but I try to focus on internal controls, risk assessments, process efficiencies. I'm also a certified fraud examiner, so whenever I'm speaking with a client, that's always top of mind, how to reduce the risk, reduce vulnerabilities, and maintain efficiencies in the process. I mentioned that we have a controllership practice, so the other thing, again, to, to give you a frame of um, reference for, for my background, um, the other thing that I do is I oversee our outsourced controllership services. So we have various different clients that may need our services for the CFO level or for the transactional transactional bookkeeper level um, across all gamuts of that and whenever we start that process I'm involved um, setting it up figuring out what skill sets meet that making sure the controls are in place and we're processing things in an efficient manner so that's kind of a little bit about me so what are the costs of fraud a lot of people say when you just have somebody stole hundred dollars is that really truly the only cost that you've got you've got reduced employee morale some other things to think about you also have weakened integrity for your whole organization potentially. You lost time. That's a huge cost. All of us have less time than we used to. I know there's still 24 hours in a day, but there isn't one client or network or connection that I've talked to in the last five years that's, that hasn't felt like their time is more precious now than it used to be. A cost could be a business failure. It's unfortunate when we see businesses actually go go under, fail, because somebody has taken advantage of them. Management distraction. Forensic accounting fees, obviously that's, that's a cost, a significant cost, potentially. Loss of stakeholder confidence. If you have donors, if you have investors, if you have anybody outside your organization that is um, donating time, a board, anything, it can, um, they'll lose confidence in, in your oversight, in your diligence overseeing the organization. Additional remedy costs if you're trying to get some of the money back. Reduce confidence of the management team. Now this could be from the bottom up. Maybe um, maybe you've got some staff people not just in finance but in other de departments see that the management team didn't keep thing, uh, things under control. Obviously we all know it's not just the management team not keeping things under control but it's really perception. We said business failure. Obviously, there's the direct cost, that $100 somebody took from the register. Recruiting fees, management people, that personnel that have to leave because of this incident, you're going to not only have the costs to get them out, potentially, but recruiting fees for a new person to replace them. PR fees, if you've got to do kind of some damage control. Potential increased insurance rates, if you are... Um, if you put in a claim for the incident. All of these things are things that you have to deal with when you are looking at the cost of fraud. So what are we going to cover today? I am very much so an agenda person, so I never start a, a session without an agenda. First, we're going to look at who are the victims of fraud. Who are they and why are they victims? Then we're going to go into why we're all here, what we can do about it. And I focus on three real areas, education, assessment, and procedure documentation. So we're going to go into each one of those very, very detailed. So one of the things that I like to do whenever I look at victims and, and kind of what the trends are is I refer to the report to the nations on occupational fraud and abuse. I mentioned that I'm a certified fraud examiner and every two years actually the Association of Certified Fraud Ex Examiners, which is a actually a worldwide, a global organization, they do a report to the nation. So they survey CFEs from around the world um, and see what, look at the different attributes of the cases that they've been engaged upon in the last two years. So again, the last one was 2014. They, there was approximately um, just under 1,500 um, cases that were in this. And what they've said, and this is the last 10 years, estimated 5% of their annual, annual revenues to occupational fraud a year, which is huge. I think if any of us look at our, look at our um, gross revenues, what we get on a yearly basis, when you start to add up that 5% per year, that adds up very, very quickly. The other thing I think is interesting that many, many times we say, or we believe that we would see that. There's no way we could lose 5% because it is such a significant number in a year, but 
trends in history indicates that we, we definitely can. There are ways to hide that. And fraud, fraudsters are very slick people in some instances. The, another thing that it um, indicated was that organizations with under 100 employees, and that's what the ACFE says under 100 employees is a small business or a small organization, had the highest frequency of fraud at 30%. So often I go into organizations and they are small businesses, small organizations, under 100 employees, and they, their trust factor is there. Over 100 employees, usually they don't, you don't get the response, well, I've known um, Joe Schmo or Sh Shirley Joe for, since I was a kid, and of course I trust them, and they would never do anything. But under 100 employees, quite often, controls are lacked a little bit because you have that trust factor, and I think that has something to do with this. The next slide um, is just a victim organization by type. So they look at private company, public company, governmental organizations, nonprofits, and others. The other category is kind of interesting. You always wonder what gets put in the other category. Regardless, um, private companies are the in 2014 actually went down a little bit from public companies, which is interesting. And again, this is just a, a statistic that I think is interesting. The next slide we've got is victim organizations by size. So this again, again goes back to what we indicated. Those organizations that are small businesses under 100 are still almost uh, right around, they hover right around 30% of all of the cases, of all the 1,500 cases. So that's, that's a pretty significant piece of the pie when you're looking at the cases that our CFEs are examining especially considering that a CFE is only hired in at the request usually of either the government, if it's a, a prosecutor in the case, the attorney or the client. The next slide is a little bit difficult to um, see and because this isn't an industry specific webinar I won't go into details but it is very interesting and it, it, it will be useful I think for all of you as you go back and look at some of this information later. If you look at what type of industry you're in, banking and financial services, I'm just looking at columns, governmental and public, manufacturing, healthcare, this really looks at the different types with, of schemes that each industry has a higher risk area for and you can see the scale in the lower left hand corner of the screen. So if you are in manufacturing for example you can know that your most historically the trends say that your most vulnerable areas are in the billing schemes, corruption and non-cash schemes. So just some just some additional ways that you can keep an eye out so what's going on out there? I'd be remiss if I didn't go into the fraud triangle on um, some of the cards that we had sent out leading up, I think since January, we've had information going out. Um, we, we gave some information on this fraud triangle, but in the 1970s, pardon me, there was a professor, um, Donald Cressy, Dr. Donald Cressy was his name, and he came out with this theory of the fraud triangle, and really what he was saying was that in every fraud that he had investigated, he could always look back and say, well, there was opportunity, there was some sort of a pressure, and there was a rationalization going on. So obviously opportunity is mostly what we're going to talk about today because that's what we have more control over. That's where we put in the internal controls to reduce the opportunity. That said, there's a lot of organizations out there that have cut things back in the last few years. Um, just in the last couple of weeks I met with, um, it was actually a religious organization, and they were talking about the fact that they have a paid staff person, but there isn't the engagement from the parishioners to help review any of the information. So they're struggling with how are we going to still have controls when we don't have the engagement. And a lot of nonprofit organizations are definitely seeing that. That part of it is time, part of it is um, a lot of the nonprofit boards aren't being paid, and part of it is people just don't want to, that liability to be on their shoulders, and they're seeing that liability spread through nonprofit boards. In small businesses, of course, we've seen cutbacks in the finance department. We've seen people really trying to just run as lean as they possibly can, which again increases the opportunity in many cases. Organizations, as you see, people that are maybe rationalizing, they didn't get that raise that they shot, thought they should have gotten or they didn't get that bonus that they thought. Um, we are seeing, seeing a swing in this because I think that we obviously the economy is coming back so people aren't as in, in such dire straits. But the other thing that um, falls into this rationalization bucket is not only people are saying I deserve it because I work so hard but also they're rationalizing it that it's not 
I'm not doing a wrong because it's really just a loan from the company. Sometimes they even keep a ledger that says, this is what I took, these are the repayments I've made. So they are rationalizing that it's not really stealing, it's not really theft or embezzlement. I'm not a fraudster because I'm going to pay this all back. They just have that whole ra rationalization in their head. And then the third triangle is pressures or need. And it's really important here to perceived pressure or need. Think that um, Shirley needs to go gambling every Friday night, or I may not think that um, Joe needs to go play Keno at the bar or, or drink every, every evening. But in their head, it's a pressure, it's a need. The other thing that are true, and I think most people feel compassion for, if there's a, a pressure from maybe another family members having health issues, we've seen so many people have layoffs. We've seen um, all of these things that are, are true, true pressures that we can really feel for and relate to. So again, what Donald Cressy was saying, that all three things put together, that's when it's kind of a breeding ground for fraud. And whenever you see one, and I've done this in the, in the embezzlements and the frauds that I've been a part of, you definitely can look back and see all of these things. So what can we do about it? We can have education, communicate it. You can't keep it bottled up. Do internal fraud risk assessments, and this sounds bigger than it is. Obviously, you can definitely get very in-depth, and it's good to do those things, but there are some quick questions you can ask and things that you can do to really at least start the process, and then have documented policies and, and um, different considerations documented so that people know what's going on and there's no um, gray lines. So with an ed education, some of the things that I like to point out, obviously that's why we're here today. It's really important to define what fraud is to you and your organization. Every single one of us on this call, in this webinar, within your organization grew up different. They came from different backgrounds, different societies, different morals. We need to make sure that fraud is fraud is fraud across all of our employees up as an example of how, uh, is it fraud to make long distance phone calls on the company line? Or is, there, is it fraud to take office supplies and um, use them for personal use? If you have a printer at home that's mostly for personal use, can you take a, a ream of paper to use at home? Is that fraud or is it not fraud? Obviously, when you get into the, um, the higher more complex and higher levels of fraud, taking $100 from the cash, cash register, that's probably fraud. But here's another one. What about buying coffee? Buying coffee for the office because you are running late to a meeting. Is that a misuse of the company funds, of the organizational funds, or is that acceptable? It's important to define that so that there are no gray lines that everybody's on the same page. Know the schemes. This is what we're going to cover in the next um, quite a few slides. It's another thing you're always going to hear when you're a fraud or embezzlement. It's important to make sure that from the top down, everyone is educated, everyone knows the definition of fraud, and everybody knows that it is a top priority to maintain controls within the organization. If you have somebody that started yesterday, see that, some, that the um, CEO or the executive is working around the process, then that sets the tone. It sets the tone that the process isn't that important because they don't feel it's important enough to follow that rule or that, that um, policy that you've got. So it's really important to set the tone at the top. The other thing um, that it's important to educate and to do is to report abuse. And I, I hear people conflicted on this sometimes. Again, I work with nonprofits. I work with a lot of small businesses. Nonprofits in particular would go back to those stakeholders, they lose, that, um, they lose that confidence that their money is going to the right purpose. But if you don't report it to the authorities, at least report the scheme to your colleagues. There's so many industry-related organizations, associations, things like that. If you're in a trade association, for example, if you're a franchise or if you're a business, uh, a manufacturing organization, there's groups, there's blogs, things that you can get in explain what happened. You don't have to give specifics. You don't have to give names. You don't even have to say what company you're with. But that same scheme is probably going to be perpetrated at another organization that's similar to yours. I always recommend reporting um, the abuse to the, to the authorities. A couple reasons. One, if you don't, that person's going to go free and probably do it again. Insurance coverage, and we'll, 
to cover the loss, you're probably going to have to report it anyway or they won't pay the claim. And then the last thing that I've got in this slide is repeat annually or with any turnover. So this means once you do education, whether it's now on this webinar or whether it's within your organization, you can't do it once and then shelf the policy, the manual, the education, the knowledge and not do it again for 10 years. You have turnover within your organization, you have changes in schemes and sometimes it's just nice to be reminded. I go to a lot of um, continuing education and things like that and then when we leave you always hear the people that say, well I knew all of that information, it was a waste of my time. Well. Was it a waste of your time? Because it at least gets you thinking about that all over again. All of us get so busy trying to get our daily activities done. Sometimes it's really step back and, and do about in a minute. Do that again to say, okay, where am I at risk? Or have I really defined fraud for all of my employees? Do I have any new employees? Has anybody's position changed or moved up within the organization? Every single time there's a change, then we have to make sure that we're re-evaluating. So the next thing that I had, had said um, under what we can do is the next thing is internal fraud risk assessment. Now here's a shameless plug. This isn't a sales webinar by any stretch of the imagination, but we definitely do these for organizations quite frequently. It's much more in depth than we're going to go into right now. Um, we work with, the, with management to really cover all of the areas that we're going to cover today. Um, it, it isn't a difficult process, but it can be a very time consuming process and provide that unbiased perspective. So if you're going to try to do this internally, what do you need to do? The first thing that I put on here is employee or volunteer assessment, employee and really not or volunteer assessment. My husband always um, I, laughs at me or kind of gives me some grief because he thinks I'm a very um, critical person or I always am thinking the worst of people or things and really I'm just assessing things. I'm, I'm skeptical and it's important to maintain that skepticism. That's not to say that you look for the worst in everyone. It's not to say that you become incredibly judgmental, but you do need to think about different avenues. So you need to assess your employees. You need to know them and know if your accounts payable or your bookkeeper if they are having financial difficulties at home. One of your employees all of a sudden seems to have a lot of extra cash flow or are um, really starting to buy extravagant things. That doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong, but again, I go back to the ostrich. Don't put your head in the sea and, ign and ignore it because if you look back and say, gosh, I should have known that, then you're going to be the one with egg on your face. An example of this, um, it, this assessment and really hindsight looking back, we'll talk about some of these things um, in a minute, but um, in Dixon, Illinois, I'm sure many of you heard about the huge million, millions of dollar fraud in um, the city of Dixon. And everyone looked back again, we'll talk about this example in a little bit, but everyone looked back and they said, well, gosh, we should have known. She threw these lavish parties. The next thing when you're looking at a, an assessment of your organization, again, first assess the employees or volunteers, then look at your physical controls. This is kind of a no-brainer. If you're in a retail organization, a food, the food industry, franchises, something like that, you need to make sure that your physical controls are, are good. Don't have an unlocked safe in the back room of the store or the restaurant that, again, is unlocked with hundreds of dollars of cash and no log. I mean, that, that's just poor physical controls. That isn't just for cash. It could be if you have a, a valuable um, supply or if you have a val valuable item that you're manufacturing, the physical controls of those things are obviously very important as well. Know and assess the schemes, knowledge of and assessment of the schemes, rather. Um, we're going to go into these schemes in the coming slides. This is really you're just asking yourself, where could I get hit? Where could my organization get hit? Ask yourself questions like, if, how would I know if all of our revenue wasn't being represented on, on the financial statements that we get? How would I know that? Is it because I have a budget in my head? Is it because I look at my expectation um, to the actual results on a regular basis? And if that's the case, then that's great. We'll go into some other things that you can do. The other thing is how would, how would somebody take money from the bank? How, would, how could potentially and who could take money, take funds, out of your bank account. 
or your investment account. How could they get that out of there? Whether it's through payroll, and again, this goes back to many of the schemes that we'll talk about in just a minute, but this goes back to payroll, disbursements. How could they get money out? Who has access to those accounts? So net set misappropriation has a lot of different facets, and we're going to look at those in detail in the next slides. We're really going to focus on that for the, for the bulk of this presentation. Corruption is huge, and if you look at any of the slides that, that from the Report to the Nations in particular that looks at what the highest percentage and types of fraud schemes were, corruption is commingled with many of them. They really, it really works well, unfortunately, and goes hand in hand, especially with billing schemes, things like that. Um, within corruption, those are things like conflict of interest, bribery, illegal gratuities, economic extortion. We're not going to go into the definition of each one of those, but you can see really it's using influence for personal gain, using influence, your influence within the organization, your influence as a vendor, um, your influence as, as someone that's on the, within the purchasing department for your own personal gain. Definitely mentioned another area of fraud is fraudulent financial reporting. Um, we're not going to touch on this today, just it's not the focus of our of our webinar, but there's financial and non-financial. Financial would be things such as revenue recognition if you're if you're um, trying to meet budget numbers, something like that, if you're putting things in different periods. Non-financial would be if you're not disclosing some contingencies maybe in the footnotes of your financial statements. Um, or some potential warranties out there, something like that. Again, with corruption, fraudulent financial reporting, if you have any questions or wanted to follow up, definitely email me. So what are some types of asset misappropriation? The first classification is obviously there's cash and non-cash. With non-cash, there's either misuse or larceny. I did a, a similar presentation for some governmental organizations, and many of them have tractors or backhoes as part of their fixed assets. Misuse would be somebody taking that and regrading their driveway or something like that. Um, maybe that's fraud. That goes back to the definition of fraud. Is that fraud or is that borrowing? Um, in my opinion, you know, unless you go through the normal um, procedures for renting that out, it is definitely misuse. Um, if something happens and it gets, it breaks, then, then what? If everything goes well and nobody finds out, obviously then no harm, no foul, but if it breaks, then are you going to go back and say, well, I don't know who was using that back of this weekend. It worked fine Friday when I left, you know, knowing that it actually broke while grading your driveway or whatever it might be, digging your swimming pool. Um, larceny would just be theft. So, so now we'll go up to the cash side. There's fraudulent disbursements. We're going to go through each one of these, so I won't dwell on them. There's a separate slide for each type, but there's fraudulent disbursements, so this is the funds that are going out, and then larceny and skimming both relate to funds coming into the organization. So we'll start with expense reimbursement and credit card problems purchasing. The way I like to tackle these is we'll look at the problem and then we'll look at some solutions to these problems. So expense reimbursement is not the number one scheme according to the ACFE, ACFE pardon me, survey, but I would argue that it probably is the number one scheme just in general. It's unreported or it's not caught is the problem. Um, I think that expense reimbursement and credit card schemes are incredibly prevalent. Um, it's not just me thinking that. It's historically, it's through different educational things. Why is that? There's books out there called How to Pad Your Expense Report and Get Away With It. These fraudsters can go out on Amazon and look up how do I pad my expense report and get away with it. And there's a book, kind of a how to do that. Now, I would would like to think that the author wrote this trying to help the fraud fighters and not the fraud stirs so that we know how to combat because unfortunately sometimes you really need to think like a fraudster to be able to combat a fraudster. Another thing that is a problem or thing that we have to fight is stores like this, the sales receipt, sales receipt store, the next website that I have on that um, PowerPoint is Smiley Generator. There's websites like this out there and you can put in all of the information you want and get a receipt that indicates whatever it is, makes it look, look legitimate. Say I go to Home Depot and I get a bunch of personal things but it would be reasonable if I got some other supply that fits for what my organization does. I can go to Sales Receipt Store or Smiley Generator, Smiley Receipt Generator, and I can just tell it what to put so I can fool my finance department. 
This can be done for anything. In some of these store, these um, websites, they not only will generate anything they want. If you send an extra two dollars or something minimal like that, you can even get the carbon copy. So it really is very, very difficult to see a fraudulent expense reimbursement. They also have some, and unfortunately, they even have templates of some of the very, very um, well-known organizations or companies out there, Home Depot, they've got a template look just like that. So there's some really big issues that we're combating out there. What do we do about that? For expense reimbursements and credit cards, it is very difficult, and I'll tell you, if you've got a big organization, I've been to various different seminars, and we focus on expense reimbursements, and there are some organizations that are so large that they have a department, and that's all they do every single day is review expense reimbursements. Um, look at credit card statements, look at the detail. Again, we were one of the solutions is requiring detail receipt for all purpose purchases. We just saw that you have to be really diligent in looking at those because the fraudsters have means to get false and fake receipts and purchases. I was at a client, and this was actually back in my audit days, and we were looking through expense reimbursements, and they, they did not require the original receipts of the receipts, and I myself on the back, but I happened to pick two of the same, um, in the sample, two of the same um, time period expense reimbursements for two different employees who said that they were on, um, they both got this Applebee's, they both had an Apple, Applebee's receipt rather. And I started looking at those receipts and they had just copied the same exact receipt over. And you could tell that because on the receipt it says what person on the table, exactly what they had, how many people were at the table. That's all information that most um, restaurants, if it's a sit-down restaurant, most of them input that when the waiter or waitress is at your table, when they're putting it into the computer system. Because those, that's all information that the restaurant likes to track, how many people are at the table, how much food are they purchasing, what, um, when somebody, you know, kind of what place they tell right then that it was a copy of the same exact receipt. So things like that, you have to be really diligent and have somebody that knows this is an important job you have, even though it seems incredibly mind-numbing to look at expense reimbursements and, and receipts all day long. Um, the next thing that we've got on there is require approval at a reporting level above the employee. So some organizations, maybe it's very, very small and you've got an assistant approving something for their boss. That's not the best situation. They're less likely to, to question things if they're you know, having to go to your boss and say, well, are you sure you really did this? Or I have a question about the legitimacy of this receipt. They're less likely to, to report that. And I said at a level above, meaning a, a close level above, the, the other extreme is having oh, approve all. Well, that's not very productive either because the CEO is probably so disconnected from the daily activities they don't really know where people are going and what they're doing. So the fourth one on there is compare calendar to mileage mileage reports and conferences. Look at the Outlook calendar. Are they really going to conferences? Are they really driving to um, a, another city? And if they are, is that mileage reasonable? Those are the things that if you get too far disconnected from the employee that's requesting the reimbursement, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to tell if those things are accurate. One thing we've kind of seen an uptick in, and this is, is related to expense reimbursements, is people who are maybe going to conferences. So maybe I go to a conference and I, I pay for it on my personal credit card, so I get the reimbursement back personally from whoever I was going to the conference for. So I just made, if, if you figure a lot of conferences out of state are $1,200 or so, I just made $1,200 and I get a vacation because my employer thinks I'm gone for three days at a conference. So those are some things really to just watch. Um, make sure people are reporting back on what they're learning at these conferences. The third thing on here is review of black hole accounts. Now that just means a lot of organizations, as we mentioned earlier, are really operating lean. So the black hole accounts aren't as numerous as they used to be, but definitely make sure you're reviewing accounts that don't have specific budgets, that don't have a detailed person reviewing over that, reviewing everything, reviewing the expectations to that account. Make sure you're looking at that. Nobody's really looking at the details in billing schemes. So we said at the beginning, billing schemes um, is one of the um, 
one of the different types of fraud and purchasing really comes right right with them they're really very similar so what can we do the problems are false vendors actual vendors with false charges Mailing address changes is something to be aware of. Obviously, it's not necessarily a problem, but frequent mailing address changes could be an indication that there's something going on there. Another type of purchasing and billing scheme is personal purchases. So some examples of this are, you know, maybe I've got ABC Company is an approved vendor in my organization and we do a lot of work for them. Maybe I create another vendor that's ABC Company Inc. or ABC Company and Associates, something like that, and I start putting in false charges um, if and that's a billing scheme, but I've just tweaked it enough so that vendor looks like something that's still um, still recognizable to whoever is approving things and they may not see that. So what do we do to combat that? What's the solution? A thorough vendor approval process. Make sure you're getting the appropriate forms. You're looking at their physical location. A lot of places may not have a physical location. They probably do have a Facebook page, a website. Make sure you're calling. Call the phone number on it and it's an actual business and it's not just some recording. Review for duplicate vendors. That goes back to the example that I just that I just mentioned. Um, compare, compare vendor addresses to employee addresses. Unfortunately, and this is probably the first thing ever that really made me interested in um, fraud and internal controls. A client, it was after we were done with the audit year, but an employee started um, writing vendor, uh, vendor payments, so they were false, it was a billing scheme, but the address for the vendor was her personal address. So if, if that company or that organization would have just compared the two, they would have seen there was a problem. So most um, softwares now you can do, you can export things to Excel, you can do periodic reviews, you can just look at the new vendors coming in and just look and see, make sure it's not employee addresses. Review reports for amounts under some specified threshold. So if you have all purchases over $500 have to be um, have to have two approvals, look for things at 490, 450, 4, 4, um, 75. It's much easier to get things through the less people that have to look at it. And then review year-to-date vendor payment totals. Whenever I coach or I train or I talk to people, whether it's in accounting services or, or within our audit department, I really like to look at vendor payments. Every single executive that I meet with, they know their top five vendors. They absolutely know who most of their money goes to. And if there's anything weird in there, if there's anything that really swings from one year to the next, they know that. So that's something that you as an organization, as, as you, for you as a consultant, who, whatever your role might be, can definitely go in and say, I just want to look at it and make sure it's reasonable. Check tampering is the next thing. This would be like a forged authorized signature, altering the payee or amount, something like that. And we have seen kind of a decrease in these a little bit just because more people are doing ACHs, are doing it through the system, and it's all a problem when you just had a checkbook and you hand wrote the checks. Um, so obviously at that point, it, it, there's much more access to tamp tampering with the checks after they're um, originated. So what should we do? Review canceled checks. Now this means it's not as easy as it used to used to be. It used to be when we, uh, a, one of our checks cleared the bank, we would get the whole check back and then it was we got copies with the bank statement and then the copies got smaller and then they were on a CD for an extra fee and now most of the time people just have access to that electronically. Depending on the kind of portal you have with your financial institution, it couldn't be easy or harder, but we definitely recommend that you periodically look at those. Most executives can get read-only um, online access or at least have some sort of access to um, canceled checks and just to make sure that they match. Review for unusual check runs or manual checks. So if you're an organization that processes everything through an accounting software and it's pretty technological or if most of your payments are ACHs or if you really cut checks every other Friday, if you see things that are manual or off-cycle go through on a Monday and it's an isolated check, why is that happening? It should be an isolated incident. It shouldn't be something that recurs. It should be there really was an emergency situation we had to, had to issue this check. But if you see a lot of these unusual check runs, it could be that somebody's circumventing the control system. So we want to make sure that we look for that. Payroll is the next thing that we'll look at. Um, what are the problems? There could be ghost employees. 
Um, a ghost employee doesn't um, necessarily mean that um, it's somebody that has deceased with it could be somebody that never remember it's a fake person altogether or it could be an employee that um, retired and it, now their name starts popping back but those people that were within the organization if they stay on maybe for an extra month maybe there's a problem within the payroll department maybe it's my cousin Sally that um, was just terminated and I keep paying cousin Sally for the month after that would still be a ghost employee sort of a situation unauthorized hours obviously that if you've got hourly employees and they're just um, inflating the number of hours that they work unauthorized rates you've got people maybe they're paid some extra bonuses or higher rates sometimes throughout the year what can we do to prevent this so we always say that we look at that you should look at payroll registers somebody aside from the payroll clerk should look at payroll registers but I like to point out not just the payroll register, you need to look at the gross and not just the net. I have some people that just look at the net amount going out. Well, if I was a fraudster and I was going to try to do something within the payroll realm, I would just inflate my gross, send it to my 401k, or send it to um, another account so that the net check or the net direct deposit is the same if you know that that's all that your manager is looking at. The other th reason that I like to say look at year-to-date totals is because the other th thing would be if I'm a fraudster in the payroll realm and I am looking to um, get money out, I'm not going to do it and then give you the payroll register. I'm going to make it an off-cycle payroll run. And if you're only looking at specific registers and not looking at the year-to-date totals, you would never see that. So this goes back to the same thing with expense reimbursements. If you've got somebody that's three levels removed or three departments removed approving timesheets for an hourly person, they have no idea what is appropriate and what wasn't, what was actually worked. So we need to make sure that those approvals are at the appropriate person. Larceny and skimming are the last couple of things that we'll look at. Um, larceny is theft after the revenue was recorded. So you ha the problem is there's an excessive refunds or credits to receivables. What can we do? Really, if you've got an expectation of your revenue, sometimes I get people that don't like the word budget. They don't want to budget. Small businesses don't. It, it's that formalized budgeting process that they may not have. But you do always have expectations, and that's the same thing. It's it's just a, a different word for it and you can do it more informally. The other thing is you'd look at this on a regular basis. Count down your cash. Make sure that um, accountability is maintained and we'll say for both larceny and skimming, count down the drawers daily at each shift change. The reason I say shift change is because if you have three different people maintaining a cash drawer, then it's very difficult to determine which one was it was embezzling if you don't have any accountability to them specifically. Um, the thing about larceny, again, before we skip to skimming, is larceny, there is a paper trail. So the larceny, the revenue has been recorded. Skimming, on the other hand, is before the revenue was recorded. So sometimes this can be much more difficult to see. This would be contributions never reported or registration fees collected, but it was never recorded in the finance system. You get cash for a sale, but you never record the sale. So you just doing the sale, or the fraudster rather, doing the sale, giving the product, but it's never recorded. So this, what can we do about that? Again, we go back to expectations. Make sure you have expectations. Compare results that you've seen in past years or past um, for past time periods or for past events. Reconcile your cash timely. Um, count draw down drawers daily. These are things that we've talked about. Require sign-offs on receipts. Sometimes this is good if you're taking in a lot of contributions or if you're having people um, um, two people count down a drawer, count down, take money if it's a fundraising event, something like that. Make sure in the sign-offs on receipts, that's really to maintain that accountability level. We need to make sure that we're doing that. So most people think skimming is um, most prevalent. Actually, according to the ACFE, billing schemes are actually cited as the most common schemes in, I, it says in here, small organizations, but I believe it was all. It was in over 40% of the cases. Now, it's interesting. If you add up all the different types of schemes, they definitely add up to more than 100%, and that is because many times they go hand in hand of industry that you are in is the most common type of scheme. Now, if you look at small versus large organizations, um, and again, small is under 100 employees, large is over 100 employees, here is just a kind of a chart 
um, of what type of scheme it is. And again, this is where I say it adds up to more than 100%. Corruption is at the top, but really most of the schemes that were investigated by these CFEs that responded to the survey, and again, it was almost 1,500 different cases, most of the schemes, corruption was involved with something else. It wasn't corruption all standing all by itself. So the next thing that we said that we were going to talk about is policies and things to consider. So what do, when I say these are five different policies manuals that I really feel strongly that you should have in place. So policies and procedures manual, it leaves less room for error. It leaves less room for people trying to just go rogue and create a process. When people create process that nobody else knows about, that provides for more opportunity. So we need to make sure that we're creating this manual. It also adds to efficiencies. If you have turnover in, a, in your organization or if you have um, questions by management, turnover really in any position, if you've got this manual, there's no questions. The next one is conflict of interest policy. Again, this outlines what's appropriate. Who can you do business with? And it really, most of the time, organizations, you've got a policy and then you have something that people sign off to say, yep, I read the policy and these are the conflicts I may have. A fraud prevention policy is what do you do if you think there is fraud? And what responsibility do you have to, to um, come forward and say you think something odd is going on? We want to make sure that our employees, all of our staff know that they can't just sit there and put blinders on even though they know that somebody is committing fraud. And then the most important or one more important thing is make sure you say within that policy what's going to be done. The person that told can remain anonymous or every um, everything possible will be done to make sure that that person remains anonymous and then we'll prosecute the other person. The person will be terminated. Document retention policy is very important to make sure that things aren't destructed when they shouldn't be and people can't then say if they're destructed destroying documents, oh, I didn't know. We've got a policy, it outlines what it should be. It really helps keep your paper trail. Expense reimbursement policy that um, can say, well, I don't think that that reimbursement was appropriate. You've got a policy outlining all of those things. If you have any questions or if you want to see any of these policies, I have templates of all of them. So definitely let me know. How are things caught? It is, in fact, tip. External audit is definitely um, something that people, there's a misconception about really what an X is designed to do. is not pure, but there's some luck to that. There's some luck to that. Now, whenever you go into an external audit, they definitely do a risk assessment. An external audit does not, is not designed to detect fraud. It's not designed to test every transaction for fraud. Um, and that's why you see that's really on the lower end of the scale for detection methods for everything in the 1,500 cases that were reported in the 2014 report to the nations. Um, again, it was TIP, and TIP has been consistent over past years. Not an audit, not management review even, and you would think that that would be um, some of the things too. One thing that is interesting is what type of TIP, and if you look the um, Report to the Nations is an extensive report, and it really goes into where is the tip coming from? Is it internal within the organization, vendors or customers or other? They definitely are looking at that. So here's an interesting thing, I think. This is controls that were in place in, in the victim organization. So you can see, I'm going to focus on under 100 employees. So in over 55% of the people that frauds occurred in their organizations or those organizations, they did have external audits and there was still a fraud. Code of conducts, 48% had those and there was still a fraud. Internal audits, almost 30% had those. Man management certification of the financial statements, so that's management going in and saying these absolutely are correct. 40%. So you can see that all of these things that we talked about or you know, external audit, internal audit, management review, those aren't the things that were protecting the org. Hotline, 18% of small businesses had a hotline. Maybe if more of those organizations had a lot hotline, there would have been less fraud. If you keep on going down, anti-fraud policies I think is really important. We just talked about only 18% of those organizations had those policies. Again, it's something that if we increase the number of organizations that are utilizing these things, these tools, then we can hopefully reduce the number of victims that we're seeing. 
So a couple other things that I wanted to point out is, um, and again, these are the last couple um, other considerations that I wanted to talk about is, most perpetrators were never charged or convicted. This is incredibly important for us to remember because we are hiring these people that were never charged or convicted. Do our background checks, but we need to make sure that we're listening to, um, we're reading between the lines, we're listening to what isn't said. There's a, there isn't very much that references can tell us legally anymore, but there's a lot that they cannot tell us. So we need to make sure that we're really listening to those things. I've got a lot of different um, contacts and things that are not only recommending but doing credit checks. Now you do have to get some, you, you have to get approval to get some of the credit checks, but they're doing those because it's, it's helping them look at that fraud triangle. It's helping them assess their new employees to see if not that they would not hire them if they had a bad credit score, but maybe they wouldn't put them as the only person in charge of the cash register if they have a poor credit score. It's really just giving you more education. You can say hindsight's 2020. Red flags in over 92% of the cases. So these are things, be skeptical, make sure you're not that ostrich. So what were the type of types of red flags? And I apologize, this is a little bit dif difficult to see. But in 45% of the cases of asset misappropriation cases, people were living beyond their means. So people were keeping up with the Jones and you could see, people could look back and say, I should have seen that. Or they had financial difficulties. I had an organization that I was working with and they knew that, that um, one of the employees was defaulting on loans. They just didn't pay attention to it. So they didn't acknowledge it and try to deal with the issue and put more controls in place. These are things that we need to think about when we're looking at assessing our employees, our volunteers. Think about these potential red flags. Again, they're not all automatic, but they're potential. A couple before we go, check with your financial institution on some fraud prevention services. We talked about many of these. There are um, a lot of different things that I recommend as I go through risk assessments and process improvements that we kind of align with the portal, the financial institution capabilities that they've got on the portal, positive pay solutions, um, remote capture deposits, things like that. But definitely check with your financial institutions or just call me, see if there's anything that we can brainstorm together that might be able to help. It isn't necessarily just your staff or your limited staff many times that you're trying to deal with. You can definitely bring in other people or other organizations and it can be cost beneficial. Look at your insurance. One, to obviously make sure it's adequate. If you had a theft, what, what could you lose? and still be okay, but also read the fine print. I had one person actually tell me that their claim was denied because they didn't have the controls in place that the insurance company thought that they should. There was never an indication beforehand that they didn't have the controls in place, they just denied the claim. So I've been even recommending specifically to some of my smaller organizations, go to your insurance company, outline your key controls. You know, I help them do that obviously, but say, Get, get the sign off, get the buy-in from them, and then you can just be insured that your insurance claim will actually be paid. And then think about hotlines. We said the most um, frauds are caught by tip. Think about a hotline or at least some way for people to provide that tip, to make that tip. Um, consider access to internal and external stakeholders. A lot of times you might see have a vendor or a board member or community member even that is the one that's actually seeing these red flags. And so just think about some. And then lastly, we went over all of these different costs of fraud. You've be, been able to think about some of these things and obviously these costs are far and above the cost it would take to do a risk assessment, far and above. Um, specifically when you talk about the publicity that you're going to get potentially, the integrity that's gone, the employee morale, things like that aren't things that you can just pay money and, and change overnight. Once you're hit, it, it takes a while to regain those things. Um, if there's any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address or phone. Um, I'm definitely always available. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a wonderful day.